Yes, fellow boxing heights. Today's video is discussing how different fighters react to their first major fights or fight. Because you could be undefeated, you could be really confident right up to the ring walk. Sometimes a fight can start and you're confident, then you realize you made a really big jump. What do you do now? So what I've did is I've wrote down a list of the different reactions, what potentially great fighters who never quite fulfilled that potential and actual great fighters, all the famous elite fighters, how they react. Because the difference can be as simple as the custom art of theory that he taught Mike Tyson about the coward. He said, um, the hero and the coward are basically the same guy, physically the same and everything. But the only difference is, is when they're confronted with um, whatever dilemma there is. The coward reacts like a coward and the hero does what he's got to do to be a hero. So the first fighter I'm going to start with is Jack Johnson when he got his title fight against Tommy Burns. Now Jack had a hard life. Jack was the son of a slave. Jack had to fight in the Battle Royals, which was really humiliating. Go and look it up. I'm not going to tell you about it because I want to whiz through this with coherency and speed. Jack faced racism that we as black people now can't even comprehend. And um, when he finally got his title fight, <laughs> he thought to himself, I'm going to teach you motherfuckers. <laughs> I mean, you can see that. He was teasing Burns in the ring. And um, he whipped Burns' his ass. They had to stop the cameras because it was a humiliating moment for the Aryan race. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, Jack Johnson, big time player. Joe Lewis. When he got his first title fight, he got knocked down by Braddock. But he stayed focused. Lewis's biggest weapon was his focus. Because you could hurt Joe and he wouldn't show you he was hurt. The old poker face. And for that to be his biggest asset when his combinations, I mean, second to none. Joe's short punches is that Julian Jackson talent. But you, you just can't teach it. To be able to throw short punches like that, it's just crazy. And, it, you know, and Joe took Braddock out. Focus and short punches. Great fighter. Here's one that you guys might not know it might be a it might be a bit before your time and um and um this fighter came to prominence with me because this was the second defense of his flyweight title he won the flyweight title in 1984 on points and his second defense was in britain against charlie magri and this guy's name was sok chitalada and Magri was a big puncher, and a lot of the British press actually thought Magri had a good chance of regaining his title. Magri was a former world champion himself. But Chitalada, with only a few fights behind him, fought like a veteran. And he stopped Magri, and he went on to hold the title for six years. He lost once in between that, and he held it for six years, and he was a great champion. Such a such a ladder. He had an old head on young shoulders, and he could fight, man. He could fight. Alexis Arguello versus Ruben Olivares. This is when Alexis challenged for Olivares's featherweight title. Now, Olivares was no ordinary champion. He already had multiple defenses behind him. He has one of the most fearsome KO records in the history of the sport. 
But Alexis showed great determination. He kept digging down, man, because they went toe-to-toe. It's a great battle. And he had the fortitude of character that was to set him on the way to become a great champion. And he won in the 13th round by KO. Dropping Oliveira's twice. Great fight. Go YouTube that one. So we know how Alexis Arguello does. Thomas the Hitman Hurts, which might be a shock inclusion for what I'm going to say next, but Thomas's first super fight was against Sugar Ray Leonard. And a lot of people, a lot of people tip turns to knock Sugar Ray Leonard out. No matter how good Ray was a boxer or how hard he hit, Hearns was just a freakishly powerful hitter and with that reach as well. Everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people thought Hearns was going to do it. And for a long period of the bout, he outboxed Ray. He outpunched Ray. But Sugar Ray Leonard showed a determination that was um, maybe put into question because of the pretty boy image. He showed a steely determination and when Hearns couldn't knock Sugar Ray out like he did previous opponents, he seemed to mentally crumble under as much as physically, in my opinion. His second real super fight, even though he beat Duran, a lot of people expected him to beat Duran at the time, but the second major super fight was against Marvin Hagler, where Thomas set off like a whirlwind cracked Hagler with some really good punches. The first round is actually said by most to be one of the greatest championship rounds ever. But after that round ended, Hagler just seemed revved up. And once again, Hearn seemed to mentally drift out of it. And Hagler knocked him out in three rounds and retained his middleweight title. So, I'm not going to say Hearns is a choker because he won many big fights, like he won the Duran fight, he beat Wilfred Benitez, and a host of other fighters. I'm not going to say he's a choker, but on his two major super fights, maybe just a little question mark, just a little one. Ricky Hatton. I'm going to bypass the Floyd Mayweather fight, even though it was a super fight I'm going to bypass that one and the reason was is because I didn't see Ricky ever win beating Floyd Mayweather I didn't see it I always saw it as a fairly one-sided fight I always saw that and um, it was fairly one-sided but I'm going to talk about the Pacquiao fight this to me this was an even money fight I thought I always thought it was and I thought it was an even fight and if you watch the fight, Ricky tags Pacquiao with a few hard shots. He does tag him a few times. And he actually seems to rock him. But Ricky had a massive following and he seemed to always want to please his following, which I never understood. You have to box to the game plan you train for or it doesn't make any sense. Like... um. I think I saw a video where he was training with Floyd Mayweather Sr. for the bout. And they was watching videos of Pacquiao where he done a certain move where he ducked under, came up and threw a punch. And there was maybe several demonstrations of Pacquiao doing that. So it seemed that Ricky had this observed, waiting to implement a counter for the move. Because he even said it himself. There he goes. da 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 duck, duck, duck. And then he comes up. Ricky said it himself. But by the time the first bell rang and the crowd is singing, there's only one Ricky Hatton. The red mist seems to get to his head. Any game plan he had out the window, he just steamed in like a madman, like it was a pub fight in Manchester or something. And that's why Floyd Mayweather Sr. was so mad when the fight finished because he was saying Ricky didn't keep his hands up, he didn't move his head, etc., etc., So that's how Ricky Hatton does. He's got the wrong temperament for big fights. Victor Ortiz. 
I'm going to bypass the Maidana fight a little because um, even though, yeah, I could touch that, I could touch that a little bit. That was, it wasn't even a big fight. He was expected to brush Madonna aside. That's why I'm not really going to touch it, but he was the golden boy, the next big thing under the golden boy banner. He thought he was the shit. And don't get me wrong, a powerful young man, good speed. He's got a lot of good things going for him. But you have to fight every fight. Like, you could be potentially fighting your last fight. And... He didn't go into that Madonna fight with that mentality, and we all know how Madonna does. Good stamina, powerful puncher, blah, blah, blah. He exposed it. But let's go to his major fight. That was with Floyd. Now, even before the Madonna fight, there was talk that Victor might have slight trouble with his mental frailness, just maybe slight. And you would have fought with that history. His coaches would have told him before fighting Mayweather, what are you going to do when you walk out there? And then bright lights hit your head. And you realize you're fighting maybe the best fighter of the last 15 or 20 years. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when you can't hit him? Like you're hitting the regular opponents you face, including Maidana, because you hit Maidana and floored him a couple of times too. What are you going to do then? And even after he committed the fouls, his choice of actions was still bafflingly stupid, the way he got himself knocked out. So at this moment in time, I'm not putting Victor down as a big fight player. Lamont Peterson and Amir Khan. Now, I'm not going to touch on Khan's knockout loss to Gradius Prescott because, again, he was expected to win. It wasn't really a big fight. It was a big shock. More a big shock than a big fight. I'm not going to touch on Peterson drawing with Victor Ortiz or losing to Tim Bradley. Because as significant as both of them fights are, at the time they were fought, there wasn't big profile fights. But when they met each other, just last year, it was definitely a big profile fight. And it was a good fight. It was a really good fight. But what we're dealing with is who makes the better use of their tools on the night when the pressure is on. I actually believe on the night, Khan just realized that he couldn't fight inside. <laughs> I think on the night he realized, not during the gym work. That's why he was so surprised when he lost the decision. And Lamont was able to adapt his tactics where he found that Khan's speed made it very difficult to box at long range. Who won the fight? It was close. It was very tight. It was very, I did, I've never scored it. It was very tight. But the thing I did observe is that Peterson had the more professional approach to actually boxing. Khan wasn't a complete fighter on the night. And if I was pushed to give a winner, I'd have to say Peterson. And the bottom line is, is Peterson made the better of his attributes than Khan was able to of his. Looking forward to the rematch. Now, Marvin Hagley is my favorite fighter, period, point blank, my favorite fighter. And he won super fights against Thomas Hearns, Duran, um, the John Mugabe fight was a great fight. But he did have the occasional big fight stumble. He did have that. His first title challenge against Antoine Fermo. He won the fight. He won the fight. They did rob him. They did rob him. But it wasn't a daylight robbery. Because... Marvin didn't push it hard enough. He was a bit cautious. And he didn't push it hard enough. And it cost him. And that cost him. And then you have the Sugar Ray Leonard bout. A lot of people were worried when Marvin was saying things like, oh, I might not just go out there and rush him. I might just outbox him. We didn't want to hear that from Marvin. 
I didn't want to hear that. I wanted to hear that Marvin was going to do the destruct and destroy mantra that he carried so well. You know what I mean? And Hagler is not boxing as a southpaw. I just don't like that at all. Why he does it, I'll never know. Gil Clancy, very knowledgeable boxing personality. I remember one time he was commentating on the Burt Cooper fight when Burt was fighting a Fijian fighter. And from early, he predicted that Burt's going to do damage with a right hook or a left hook because of how the guy was throwing his punches and how he was stanced. And it happened exactly as he called it. He observed early that Marvin needed to be in the southpaw stance because that was the only way to neutralize Leonard's left hand. You know? But instead, he went orthodox and that sort of put him in the range of Leonard's jab and his left hooks. And Leonard took advantage of the first four rounds. He didn't win the fight to me, but it was close enough that he could have been given the fight. Hagner's later career was based on being a master slugger. You know? He based his late career on that. And even if he was back in the old days where he was a master boxer, Boxing against Leonard is maybe not the cleverest idea for anybody. Because let's face it, Ray's a great boxer. A great boxer. And Marvin is far from a choker. Far from a choker. But the reason I put him on the list is just to show that even the elite fighters who win more super fights than they lose, even they can get it wrong on occasion. And Marvin did avenge the Antofermo loss. He did avenge it. Muhammad Ali, have to put him on the list, man. You know what I mean? Um, he's a great super fight player. Maybe the greatest of all time. And it didn't matter whether he was boxing at range or doing the rope dog I mean, just look at the track record. Sonny Liston, Rumble in the Jungle, Thriller in Manila, and the second Leon Spinks fight. I'm not going to go through all of Ali's accolades because... I'm going to give some light to some less obvious names as well on a video. Jerry Cooney and Tommy Morrison. Two white hopes from the 80s and the 90s. These guys were given all the big build-up, knocked out a lot of tomato cans, and the press jumped all over them. Yeah, these guys are the shit. And as soon as they fought, elite competition mainly when they fought the top African Americans they both got killed and the reason I'm bringing them up is not to try and diss white people I'm not doing that I'm not doing that but I'm just pointing out this is why if you're a boxer you can't let the newspaper headlines of what they're saying and some of the stupid even up to recently I'd hear comments about white fighters from credible boxing people. They say, yeah, he's a good prospect. He's a good prospect. Plus, being white doesn't hurt him either. Meaning that he's going to sell tickets. And to be fair on Tommy Morrison, he used to disassociate himself from the label of being a white hope. Dennis Rappaport, Jerry Cooney's manager, Rappaport was a bit of a nutter. And let's just say, just to build the fight with Larry Holmes, he let it fester just enough to keep that angle of the white and black angle there just long enough, you know? And um, Cooney, after feasting on the old remains of Ken Norton and other old fighters, just couldn't bridge the gap against a man with one of the best jabs the heavyweight division has seen, and that's Larry Holmes. Underestimated fighter. And if we talk about Larry's big match temperament, not bad at all. You know, I'm not going to... The Ali was a big fight for him, but I'm not going to put that in the mix. But when he won the vacant title against Ken Norton, oh, he dug down deep. Because as an amateur, Larry was always known to be gifted, but they thought he lacked heart. I think he... Did he quit in the fight against Dwayne Bobick or something like that? And a few other lackluster displays. But he got his act together as a pro. And he was definitely a big fight player. 
Nassim Hamid found himself a step behind Barrera, whether it was with the jab or the roughhouse tactics, all the way through the 12 round featherweight title fight. Nassim got himself gassed by his natural power. His punching power in at least three bouts, as I can remember. One with Kevin Kelly, another one with Augie Sanchez. He was using it as a bailout card, basically, where his unorthodox technique got exposed, you know, and he used to keep his hands very low, and then he'd draw left hooks from his waist and uppercuts. And they were very damaging punches, and he was using that as a bailout card. He had very powerful legs, which he used to generate a lot of power from. When he fought Barrera and faced an excellent boxer, Barrera started out as a slugger, but he really modified his technique excellently. He got exposed big time. He couldn't get in the fight for the life of him, and that one fight ruined him because he couldn't distract Barrera with um, his feints or his exaggerated head movement. He couldn't distract Barrera, who was just calm as anything, just slamming the jab, and he didn't pour the jab. He was throwing that jab in hard. Has some hard rights behind it as well. And he exposed Hamid pretty badly. Meldrick Taylor, his first big fight came against Julio Cesar Chavez. Now, I was positive that Meldrick Taylor was going to win this fight on points. Because as good as Chavez was, Meldrick Taylor's hand speed, his actual hand speed, is probably faster than Floyd. I'm talking about the frame punches. Probably faster than Floyd, his hand speed. Go and watch some of his fights if you don't believe me, how fast Meldrick Taylor's hands were. Just like blurs. And I was really convinced that he was going to beat Chavez on plates. Now, let me break this down for you. Bernard Hopkins is not a typical Philadelphia fighter by any stretch of the imagination. The archetypal Philadelphia fighter is a good slugger. If you go to the Blue Horizon, I don't know if they still do fights there, but it used to be promoted by Russell Peltz. And if you was fighting on there and you wasn't giving the crowd 100% blood and guts, they'll let you know about it. And if you like, you can do the research on the gym wars in Philly. And Meldrick was cut out of that cloth there. He was a true Philly fighter to the point he didn't know where to cut off. And that's how he lost the fight against Chavez because from the first round to the 11th, he was out punching Chavez two to one, three to one, just out punching him. And Chavez did land some good shots, but it was Meldrick's night all the way. Now, Meldrick came out for the 12th and last round. And George Benton and Lou Duva warned him, be a bit careful, son. <laughs> you know what I mean? Box on your back foot. You won all the rounds. You've got nothing else to prove. You know what I mean? Grab him. You know what I mean? Skit around the ring. Do what you got to do. No, not Meldrick. And he just kept slugging, kept slugging, kept slugging. And you see when you fight great fighters like Chavez, the reason he's a great fighter is because there could be half a second left on that clock and they could win it. That's why he's a great fighter. Because they can make things happen what shouldn't happen. They can make it happen, and he did. Meldrick got stopped in the last, was it, six or seven seconds. Richard Steele stopped the fight after he got floored. And it was heartbreaking for him. You had to feel for him. You had to feel for him. Like, people question, was Richard Steele in Don King's pocket because Don King was Chavez's promoter? And, yeah, maybe that could be a factor because to stop the fight at six seconds does sound harsh. But at the same time, Meldrick was taking a bad beating when it was stopped. And he, his eyes were glazed over. And if Richard had let him out, who knows what would have happened. The whole point is, is that a big match player wouldn't have let that happen. Lennox Lewis, his first big test was against Razor Ruddock. Just after Ruddock came off two credible fights against Mike Tyson. 
I was hoping Lennox could shade it on points. I was hoping that. But the back of my mind was always saying that Ruddock's going to knock Lennox out. Lennox hadn't quite established himself at the time. And some of his performances wasn't that intimidating, for a better word. And um, it was a shock because for some reason, man, when Lennox came out and Ruddock came out, Lennox just looked powerful. Just the way he was standing, he looked really powerful. And it was only then you realised Lennox is one big brother because Ruddock was built like a tank. You know what I mean? But Lennox just put on a clinic with that jab, man. And none of us were that aware that he was so aware of his attributes and how to use his size that well. His jab was just a thing of brilliance on that night. His combinations were just excellent, man. Like, he didn't run like everyone thought. He just, that nice little sidestep. And the straight right he threw to deck my man. It was like, wow. We celebrated hard that night, man. It was a good night. And Lennox proved himself to be a big-time player on the big night. Mike Tyson versus Trevor Burbick. <laughs> yeah, Mike. <laughs> I mean, Mike was no joke, man. Yeah, I mean, Mike was no joke. But Mike had that head movement and them combinations. You know them days. Remember he used to come out and do that funny run in <laughs> some of them fights he, where his leg, his, um, his heel used to nearly touch his thigh when he ran. Remember? That Tyson there was no fucking joke, man. <laughs> wow. That was just a clinical title win, man. Like, Mike was just focused, man. Mike was focused. And he scared Burbick. He scared Burbick. Burbick was frozen to the spot, and he was frozen in his thoughts. And um, Mike couldn't believe the present that he got when Burbick just stood in front of him. Because Burbick didn't know what to do, so his only thing was, let me stand in front of him and try and out-muscle him. And as I said before, man, <laughs> if you fight in the 85, 86, or 87 Mike Tyson, and somebody gave you a boxing manual saying the way to beat Mike Tyson is to stand right in front of him and slug with it, I would tell you, you need to burn that book. And may it never resurface to the earth again. Tyson executed everything to perfection on that night, man. Everything. And you see, Tyson was a historian of the game. He used to watch all of Jim Jacobs' fight reels. And he obviously developed a self-worth where he thought to himself, I'm going to become the youngest heavyweight championship ever. You know, Customato pumped him up as well so much that he believed that he belonged to be remembered next to the Jack Johnsons, the Arleys and the Joe Lewises, you know. Rocky Marciano, his first test, major test, was against Jersey Joe Walcott for the world title. Jersey Joe did a good job of using his reach to outbox Marciano and frankly hand him a really good beating. And let's get a few things straight. Rocky didn't hold the title for as long as a lot of the great champions like Lewis, like um, Ali, like Holmes. And he didn't have, he didn't have a great jab. He didn't have no footwork really. But Rocky was tough, man. He also had a very hard punch. And the old times will tell you he wasn't bothered if he could get a clear shot at your chin because his old thing was just punching your forearms man until the blood vessels bust in your forearms and shit you can't lift your arms up you know like a bulldozer and yeah Joe was well ahead on points man but Rocky stayed with it and he caught him with a right hook he dropped Walcott and while Walcott was sort of down on one knee, he gave him a nice little <laughs> touch with a left hook to go with it to make sure, say, he weren't getting back up again. Yeah, it was illegal, but shit happens, it's boxing, you know? And Marciano was a rough house. If you like a dirty fighter too, just go and look at the fights with Don Cockle, some of the tactics that he used against Archimor. Just go and look at them, you know what I mean? And you'll see. Mark Breland, 
is who I'm going to end the video with. Mark Breland was a really good amateur. He won the Olympics. He was known as a KO puncher as an amateur. He turned pro where things are a little different. He must have ran up maybe 20 plus victories before he had his real acid tests against the underrated Marlon Stalin. Breland was defending his WBA World weight champion, which was a gift, really, because he beat some South African dude. It was Harold Volbrecht or something. Really wasn't that good a fighter. It was just a gift, really, to give him a belt. Everybody knew that the Stalin test was the real test. And Stalin wasn't a particularly tall welterweight. He wasn't a short welterweight. But he was like Hagler, where Hagler wasn't particularly tall, but he had a really long reach. The starting had a similar, that similar physique, you know? And um, Starling just roughhoused Breland, just roughhoused him. Like at times he was just throwing him around like a ragdoll. And Mark just collapsed in the mental. He just collapsed. He tried to keep it long range, but every time Starling came in close, you could just see the fear in his face. It was just, it was horrible to see, to see such a touted fighter just collapsed like that. And Stalin took him out in the late rounds. And Breland was never really the same. I think he might have picked up another belt at some stage. But he was just never the same. And that just wrote his eulogy as a fighter, I suppose. So this would be a good time to wrap this one up. So I'm going to say peace out. Peace.